What can you have to say to me today, George Harford? You can have nothing to say to me. You must leave this house. Rachel, Gerald knows everything about you and me now, so some arrangement must be come to that will suit us all three. I assure you, he will find in me the most charming and generous of fathers. My son may come in at any moment. I saved you last night. I may not be able to save you again. My son feels my dishonor strongly, terribly strongly. I beg you to go. Last night was excessively unfortunate. That silly Puritan girl making a scene merely because I wanted to kiss her. What harm is there in a kiss? A kiss may ruin a human life, George Harford. I know that. I know that too well. We won't discuss that at present. What is of importance today, as yesterday, is still our son. I am extremely fond of him, as you know. And odd though it may seem to you, I admired his conduct last night immensely. He took up the cudgels for that pretty prude with wonderful promptitude. He is just what I should have liked a son of mine to be, except that no son of mine should ever take the side of the Puritans. That is always an error. Now, what I propose is this. Lord Illingworth, no proposition of yours interests me. According to our ridiculous English laws, I can't legitimize Gerald, but I can leave him my property. Illingworth is entailed, of course, but it is a tedious barrack of a place. He can have Ashby, which is much prettier, Harborough, which has the best shooting in the north of England, and the house in St. James Square. What more can a gentleman require in this world? Nothing more, I'm quite sure. As for a title, a, a title is really rather a nuisance in these democratic days. As George Harford, I had everything I wanted. Now I merely have everything that other people want, which isn't nearly so pleasant. Well, my proposal is this. I told you I was not interested, and I beg you to go. The boy is to be with you for six months in the year, and with me for the other six. That is perfectly fair, is it not? You can have whatever allowance you like and live wherever you choose. As for your past, no one knows anything about it except myself and Gerald. There is the Puritan, of course. The Puritan in white muslin. But she doesn't count. She couldn't tell the story without explaining that she objected to being kissed, could she? And all the women would think her a fool and the men think her a bore. And you need not be afraid that Gerald won't be my heir. I needn't tell you I have not the slightest intention of marrying. You come too late. My son has no need of you. You are not necessary. What do you mean, Rachel? That you are not necessary, George, to Gerald's career. He does not require you. I do not understand you. Look into the garden. Lord Illingworth rises and goes to look out the French window. You had better not let them see you. You bring unpleasant memories. She loves him. They love each other. We are safe from you, and we are going away. Where? We will not tell you. And if you find us, we will not know you. You seem surprised. <laughs> what welcome would you get from the girl whose lips you tried to soil? From the boy whose life you have shamed? From the mother whose dishonor comes from you? You have grown hard, Rachel. I was too weak once. It is well for me that I have changed. I was very young at the time. We men know life too early. And we women know life too late. Rachel. I want my son. My money may be of no use to him now. I may be of no use to him, but I want my son. Bring us together, Rachel. You can do it if you choose. He sees Gerald's letter on the table. There is no room in my boy's life for you. He is not interested in you. Then why does he write to me? What do you mean? What letter is this? Lord Illingworth takes up the letter from Gerald. 
That is nothing. Give it to me. It is addressed to me. You are not to open it. I forbid you to open it. And in Gerald's handwriting. It was not to have been sent. It is a letter he wrote to you this morning before he saw me. But he is sorry now he wrote it. Very sorry. You are not to open it. Give it to me. It belongs to me. He opens it, sits down, and reads it slowly. Mrs. Arbuthnot watches him. You have read this letter, I suppose, Rachel? No. You know what is in it? Yes. I don't admit for a moment that the boy is right in what he says. I don't admit that it is any duty of mine to marry you. I deny it entirely. But to get my son back, I am ready. Yes, I am ready to marry you, Rachel, and to treat you always with the deference and respect due to my wife. I will marry you as soon as you choose. I give you my word of honor. You made that promise to me once before and broke it. I will keep it now, and that will show you that I love my son as least as much as you love him. For when I marry you, Rachel, there are some ambitions I shall have to surrender. High ambitions, too, if any ambition is high. I decline to marry you, Lord Illingworth. Are you serious? Yes. Do tell me your reasons. They would interest me enormously. I have already explained them to my son. I suppose they were intensely sentimental, weren't they? You women live by your emotions and for them. You have no philosophy of life. You are right. We women live by our emotions and for them. By our passions and for them, if you will. I have two passions, Lord Illingworth. My love of him and my hate of you. You cannot kill those. They feed each other. What sort of love is that which needs to have hate as its brother? It is the sort of love that I have for Gerald. Do you think that terrible? Well, it is terrible. All love is terrible. All love is a tragedy. I loved you once, Lord Illingworth. Oh, what a tragedy for a woman to have loved you. So, you really refuse to marry me? Yes. Because you hate me? Yes. And does my son hate me as you do? No. I am glad of that, Rachel. He merely despises you. Oh, what a pity. What a pity for him, I mean. Don't be deceived, George. Children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. Lord Illingworth reads the letter over again, very slowly. May I ask by what arguments you made the boy who wrote this letter, this beautiful, passionate letter, believe that you should not marry his father, the father of your own child? It was not I who made him see it. It was another. What fond is the Ecla person? The Puritan, Lord Illingworth. Lord Illingworth winces, then rises slowly and goes over to the table where his hat and gloves are. Mrs. Arbuthnot is standing close to the table. He picks up one of the gloves and begins putting it on. There is not much then for me to do here, Rachel. Nothing. It is goodbye, is it? Forever, I hope, this time, Lord Illingworth. How curious. At this moment, you look exactly as you looked the night you left me twenty years ago. You have just the same expression in your mouth. Upon my word, Rachel, no woman ever loved me as you did. Why, you gave yourself to me like a flower, to do anything I liked with. You were the prettiest of playthings, the most fascinating of small romances. George pulls out his watch. Quarter to two. Must be strolling back to Hunstanton. Don't suppose I shall see you there again. I'm sorry. I am, really. It's been an amusing experience to have met amongst people of one's own rank and treated quite seriously, too. One's mistress, one's... Mrs. Arbuthnot snatches up the remaining glove and strikes Lord Illingworth across the face with it. Lord Illingworth starts. He is dazed by the insult of his punishment. 
Then he controls himself and goes to the window and looks out at his son with Hester. He sighs and leaves the room. Rachel falls, sobbing on the sofa. He would have said it. He would have said it. Enter Gerald and Hester from the garden. Well, dear mother, you never came out after all, so we have come in to fetch you. Mother, you have not been crying. My boy! My boy! My boy! But you have two children now. You will let me be your daughter. Would you choose me for a mother? You, of all women I have ever known. They move towards the door leading into the garden with their arms around each other's waists. Gerald goes to the table for his hat. He sees Lord Illingworth's glove lying on the floor and picks it up. Hello, Mother. Whose glove is this? You've had a visitor. Who was it? Oh, no one. No one in particular. A man of no importance. A Woman of No Importance was read at Quiros Gallery in Manhattan in October 2011. Lord Illingworth was read by Ross Hewitt. Lady Arbuthnot by Michelle Sims. Gerald Arbuthnot by Richard Kent Green. Hester Worsley by Lisa Adams. Lady Hunstanton by Charlotte Hamden. Mrs. Allenby by Temmie Rose. Lady Caroline by Lucy McMichael. Mr. Kelville by Paul Singleton. Sir John by Jerry Rogers. Archdeacon Daubeny by Don Brennan. Lady Stutfield and Alice by Shelley Little. Lord Alfred, Farquhar, and Francis by Arthur Harold. The narrator was read by Stephen Bidwell. Music credits, photographs, and useful links can be found online at www.tocyberwhelm.org.